So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, interleukin-11, because not many people know what it is, uh, because it's very little studied uh, cytokine and largely misunderstood. So just as some high-level summary here, it's a member of the IL-6 family, but it's very different to IL-6. It's pro-fibrotic and fibroblasts in an ERK-dependent fashion. It's anti-regenerative across organs. We've seen this in kidney, liver, and lung. It's pro-inflammatory across cell types. It's a component of the SASP. Uh, its receptor is widely expressed both in epithelial cells and in stromal cells, and it is very largely misinterpreted in the earlier literature. And I would refer you to this, um, re this reference down the bottom if you want to understand that a bit more. So just to, to buttress that with some data, so this is when we first found IL-11. This is our Nature paper from 2017, where we took human cardiac fibroblasts from patients in the hospital, from 80 patients, stimulated them with TGF-beta, did RNA sequencing, and asked the question what goes up and what doesn't. And out of that mean upregulation of I-11 is 8.4-fold, so genome-wide the most significantly highly upregulated gene, uh, it was interleukin-11. And interleukin-11 is required in an autocrine feed-forward loop in fibroblasts for fibrosis. If you put TGF-beta onto a cell and it inhibit I-11, the fibroblast um, doesn't get turned on. So this is showing you uh, a paper which is currently in review in Nature Communications, uh, in revision. Um, so this is showing you kidney regeneration. So in this um, instance, we've taken kidneys. Uh, you can see them here from a control mice. Uh, they're mice like beans. But then if we give the mice um, a toxin, a nephrotoxin, you get shrunken kidneys. And those, uh, this is four weeks later. And then if you treat them with IgG for 12 weeks, you still have shrunken kidneys. They don't grow back. But if you give them anti-I11, the kidney parenchyma grows back, you get restoration of function, and you get kidney regeneration. And this is an epithelial-driven phenomenon. So this is BRDU injected into mice on anti-I11 therapy with CKD, chronic kidney disease. And you can see that you're getting this very nice tubular epithelial cell-driven regeneration. So this is I11 effect in the, in the epithelium itself, not in the stroma. And I-11 is pro-inflammatory. So here we've taken some human uh, kidney fibroblast and subjected them to a fairly standard uh, proteomic analysis. You can, this is O-Link, and you're probably aware of it. And you can see if you put I-11 onto these cells, they begin to chuck out a whole load of cytokines, chemokines, and chemotractins. And you can see here, you will probably recognize, being the aging team, that there are some components of the SASP. So moving forward, I'd like to now link to aging. So this, this is a um, manuscript which has just came out uh, last month, I think, uh, in iScience. Uh, it took us a while to get it published. And this, I'll just summarize what it says and, come, and then flesh it out a little bit, is I-11 stimulates ERK P90 risk. So ERK is upstream, then it hits P90 risk, which then duly phosphorylate LKB1 at two different sites, serum 325 and serum 428, which inactivates LKB1. This inactivates AMBK it turns on TOR, and that is seen across cell types that we've looked at, and it drives a mesenchymal program, EMT-type program, across cells. So this is just a graphical representation of the pathway now. So interleukin-11 uh, binds to its cognate receptor, IL-11RA, um, uh, which then binds to GP130 to signal. Now, people will tell you that the canonical signaling of, 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 G of IL-11 is through STAT, and that's the taught uh, wisdom, and indeed it does activate STAT transiently, but it also activates uh, ERK strongly and in a sustained manner uh, for, for the long term. And so what I'm showing you here is once ERK is activated, it phosphorylates risk. These then impinge on LKB1, dual phosphorylation and inhibition of LKB1. This turns off AMPK, turns on TOR, turns on S6K, and, and you actually see things downstream of this with EPRS. Um, Everything here with an asterisk is, is involved in aging with a lot of data to support it. I'm sure you'll all be aware of those publications. You may not be quite so aware of the uh, importance of LKB1 in aging. So LKB1 in itself is an aging gene. Uh, and what's interesting about LKB1 is that its gain of function is good. So inhibiting it is bad. And here's a, a C. elegans, a worm, a worm study here. And here's a very nice gain of function Drosophila screen where they identified LKB1 as a lifespan ex extending gene. So gain of function increases your lifespan in, if you're a fly. 
So coming to some of the data now, so we're looking now here at I11 and its role in replicated senescence. So we've taken some human uh, fibroblasts, the cardiac fibroblasts, we then culture them repeatedly until they uh, stop replicating. And you can see here, just if you look at P14, we've done this in the presence of IgG or an anti-I11 antibody, anti-I11 receptor antibody. So at P14, when they're senescing, ERK is on, RISC is on, LKB is phosphorylated and inactivated, AMPK is off, TOR is up, all the pathways on, you have senescence markers, you lose your cycling, and actually you also have inflammatory components as well. In the presence of anti-I11, that whole thing is gone. So you turn off the entire pathway by inhibiting that signaling, you turn off the senescence, you, you restore some cycling, and actually you have this knock-on effect here on inflammation, which is, uh, which is a, a, an added bonus to, to a side pathway. And if you, if you measure the I11 or IL8 in, this, in the medium of these cells over the passages, in the presence of inhibition of I11, you stop, uh, you inhibit secretion of I11 itself, which is a feed-forward loop, and also things like IL-8, IL-6, et cetera, et cetera. So you pre prevent SAS secretion, which is TOR-dependent. So what about aging? So these are aging mice. Uh, so we've taken mice from the age of 12 weeks to 110 weeks old, and we've done this in all organs. This is uh, work from the liver, which Anissa produced just the other, other week. Um, and you can see that I11 goes up in, in, across age, and that is associated with activation of its pathway, ERK, P90 risk, LP, um, LKB1, MPK is off, TOR is on, etc. So this I11 is upregulated in all tissues of the body and associated with activation of this pathway in all organs. Uh, and this is just to show you graphically, this is a male and female mice, either 12 weeks old or 110 weeks old, showing you I11 levels in three uh, biological uh, replicates, um, liver, heart, kidney, um, soleus, and abdominal fat. Abdominal fat is particularly prominent, you may notice that. So we have done a fair number of studies over the last five years, and I really don't have time to tell you much on these, but I'm going to just give you a few snippets, uh, mentioning about the I11 receptor knockout mice, and also with the pharmacological um, interventions, I'm going to talk about when we treated mice from 75 weeks to 100 weeks old with anti-I11 therapy. So just one piece of data here from I11 receptor knockout mice. So we uh, took their livers uh, when they were about 100 weeks old, and we sent them over to this company, Mouse DNA Services, and asked, asked them to estimate the age of these mice. Uh, so they estimated the mice were about 80 uh, weeks old if they were wild type. But you can see here the knockouts actually were estimated to be 50 weeks younger by this epigenetic clock, even though these are let it make controls. So really quite a marked uh, uh, um, data analysis from this company. Um, and if you look in the tissues, here we're looking at young mice and old mice, and this is the 110 week old, it's the liver, and you can see the knockout, the whole pathway is gone, and your senescence is also gone. And these are the livers which are 50 weeks younger by your epigenetic clock. So moving on to the uh, longer uh, study here with the 75 weeks to 100 week old mice, they either get no treatment, they get an IgG control antibody or anti-I11, and we give this uh, once every three weeks by an IP injection, and then we follow these mice up. So what happens to these mice? Well, this is body weight normalized to starting, so they lose weight. If they get anti-I11, they lose about 15% of their body weight. If you put them in metabolic cages, they're actually eating more. They, they feel better and they're eating more food, but they actually lose weight compared to those untreated IgG. If you then kill them at the end, this is um, because they're starting fat at 75 weeks, uh, but with the anti-I11, which is X203 here, they lose the visceral fat. It just melts away, uh, but actually their, their muscle mass is maintained, and actually in a gram per gram weight, they actually increase their muscle mass and have improved uh, grip strength. Uh, frailty, obviously, we have, we've done frailty as well, so this is showing you the mice frailty score at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study, and with no intervention, they progress to frailty. With IgG, they progress to frailty, but with anti-I11 over this time course, there is no progression in their frailty over 25 weeks in the mouse. In fact, some of them are going the other way. And actually, a fair amount of this frailty is driven by uh, less tremor, improved gait, reduced vestibular disturbances. Uh, I think I've turned the noise off. Let's see. Okay, so this is the only data I'm showing you on the R11 knockout mouse. Uh, it's not data, it's a picture, but I think it's quite illustrative. So here you see the knockout mice, at 100, about 100 weeks old. They have nice coats, they are thin, they are running around, and here are their litimate controls, uh, the wild type, when they have uh, I11 activity, which are fatter, slower, and uh, exhibiting signs of frailty at around 100 weeks. Uh, thymus weight, 
uh, is, uh, goes down as, as, as we age and mice age. So 75 weeks is the thymus weight, and it will then decrease if you, don't, if you get nothing called IgG at 110 weeks. But this is actually inhibited with anti-I11. And I think this is important because this places inflammation upstream of Im immunosenescence. We don't have functional data on this, and we can't, I can't show you that. But we, we presume this is actually affecting immunosenescence in the thymus. Um, and just for a bit of fun, I'm a cardiologist. I don't know what to do with brains, but we can weigh them. So we weighed the brains, um, and lo and behold, with age, mice uh, get um, atrophy of the brain, so this is about an 8% loss, but with anti-I11 therapy of that time, you get a, an inhibition of brain atrophy. Uh, again, I, I, we, I can't tell you more about that because we haven't done the experiments. So I'd want to like to end here just with a kind of a snapshot of how we see um, I-11 in this context. So if you're aware of drugs, which everyone's very interested in, talked about a lot here today and, and yesterday, so you can hit individual pathways, and Professor Partridge's group has shown very nicely that you, if you actually use combination therapy, you can have additive value. Um, issue with this is you have on-target toxicity, as, as not all ERK is bad, not all TOR is bad, and increasing AMPK is good, but you don't want too much. So there, there are on-target toxicities of these drugs. So with anti-I11, you, you get a combination effect, decreasing ERK, activating AMPK, decreasing TOR, and in, in, inhibiting senescence with a single agent. Uh, we believe you'll have limited on-target toxicities as you're only hi hitting the aging perturbed pathways. I-11 is not expressed in health. So when you inhibit it, you should only be inhibiting uh, bad things. Uh, these are human knockouts for the I-11 receptor. Basically, they have no phenotype that's uh, measurable apart from a mild cranial stenostosis, a very mild developmental abnormality of the skull. Other than that, they are well, and therefore it makes it a good um, drug target. Mm -hmm.